Uh, but I really appreciate uh, everybody coming out. Uh, so how this kind of uh, was conceived, first I'm Jeremy Moss. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the state representative for here in Southfield, Lathrop Village, Beverly Hills, Bingham Farms, and Franklin. And how this was originally conceived is every, about every third Monday of the month, I have a coffee hour here in the library. It times out so that it's about an hour and a half before the start of the Southfield Council meeting, before the Lacer Village Council meeting, before the Bingham Farms trustee meeting. So it works out that if you wanted to go to a different meeting in your part of the district and grab some coffee to stay caffeinated if you had to stay up and watch those meetings, we were here to caffeinate you. Uh, and also um, answer any questions you have about what's been going on in Lansing. So we, we started in uh, February, uh, had one in March, and now this is our April coffee hour. The conversation in February and, and March was so uh, encouraging, enlightening, uh, lively, and most of it centered around road funding, particularly because we have this May 5th vote coming up. So I wanted to make sure that April's coffee hour w was a little bit different um, and we could just solely focus on a presentation about the road funding proposal and other road funding and get, gather your thoughts uh, on it uh, and so that you can be fully informed. I'm the first to tell you this is a very confusing proposal. It's not straightforward. I, everybody believes that. You know, everybody knows that. But we're here to walk you through it so you have a better sense of what it's actually going to do before you vote on May 5th. Um, next month, probably around that third Monday uh, of the month, which uh, again will time out to the Southfield City Council meeting. We'll resume regularly scheduled programming. We will open it up for any topic you want to bring forward. But for tonight, um, you can grab me after the coffee hour if you have a specific issue outside of road funding. But we're going to try and tailor all questions on this proposal uh, and the presentation on road funding. Um, and we want to make sure you had all the information. So, without further ado, I ask John Lamacchia from the Michigan Municipal League to come down and kind of walk through uh, what's on the proposal, what's on the ballot. Uh, Michigan Municipal League is, is really a strong force of an organization of all of the cities uh, throughout Michigan, and they uh, advocate for our most local pressing needs uh, here on our local level to our legislators in Lansing. When I was on the City Council, I was very involved in Michigan Municipal League. I see my friend Myron Frazier from the Southfield City Council in the back, who is incredibly active with the Michigan Municipal League. So I trust, having worked with them as a councilman and now working with them as a legislator, Michigan Municipal League has been great on research, has been great on uh, digging deep into these issues that affect our local communities. So I, I was happy that John had a presentation ready on this proposal uh, and certainly trust uh, the Michigan Municipal League to do their due diligence and explain what this proposal is about. So after, I think if any of you have an agenda, after John uh, does his presentation, I'll walk through a PowerPoint presentation on my own of some frequently asked questions that I've heard from you about this proposal. I heard it at our last coffee hour. I hear it when you grab me in the grocery store. I hear a lot of questions on the proposal. So I kind of wrapped up uh, kind of a, a summary of the most frequently asked proposals. And I'll go through that, and then we'll open it up to Q&A from you. So this goes until about 7 o'clock. Um, you know, you can stick around. You can go to the Southfield City Council meeting afterward. Uh, but uh, if you have questions, um, we'll answer them throughout. But mostly, uh, maybe you might want to hold off, write your question down, because it might be something that I answer in my presentation. Um, and we'll have a whole section for questions and answer at the end. So I'll turn it over to John now, and then we can get started on, uh, on the PowerPoint presentation he prepared. Uh, thank you, Representative. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I will use the mic. I apologize. I cut my grass for the first time yesterday, <laughs> and I got a little bit of allergies kind of acting up right now. So if you, usually I'm pretty good at projecting, but if you can't hear me in the back, let me know, and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to pick up the mic. You know, and I think uh, Representative Moss really did a... a good job of one kind of introducing you know who we are as an organization and who we represent uh, but also the fact that you know the proposal that's before us has a lot of moving parts right and us as an organization we support it and it wasn't an easy decision for us to support it to be very honest with you I've been involved with this issue since Governor Snyder in 2003 kind of laid out his original plan and I'm going to walk through some of that so I've sat at that negotiating table, I've been involved in committee testimony, 
throughout this two years, and we would really hope that the legislature would have solved this problem <coughs> on their own. And there's probably a lot of you in the audience, I know there are those across the state, that kind of had that same sort of thought process. But there is a very good reason why they didn't do it and why we're at where we are today. And I really want to explain that to you because I think it's important to understand that this isn't something that just happened in the middle of the night in December. Now that's when it did happen, but that's, it's not like they just started talking about it about three in the morning and two and a half hours later decided to vote on it. It's been quite the process, but you know, I'm going to take you back a little bit here with the first slide, about a decade. And this is kind of state roads. This is so your, your truly local road, but a good measure uh, is kind of how we look at our state system. And in 2005, about 12.5% of the roads out there were actually in poor condition. Right? But as we move forward, we've seen that number increase over the last decade to just about 34%, and that's a trend that will continue if no new revenue is found for roads. So the question is, well, why did that happen? There's a couple of factors. In 1997, we raised the gas tax by four cents. <coughs> when we raised the gas tax in 97, we did not add an inflationary mechanism to that. So the amount of dollars that we were getting in in 97 are roughly equal to the dollars that we're getting now. right? But what has happened, much like in our own lives, where the cost of purchasing things has gone up, the cost of building roads has come up, has gone up. But the amount of revenue in the system to pay for that has not changed. So your purchasing power has decreased. So where maybe you would have been able to do, say, and these are just <coughs> random numbers, 10 road projects a decade ago, you can only do eight now with that same amount of money. And so as a result of that, what we have seen is that deterioration in our network. And as the network de deteriorates, that's when we see the problems that we see with potholes, <coughs> and those sorts of things. But what that lack of revenue doesn't allow for, it doesn't allow for the right fix every single time. So where you see people filling potholes, we should actually be doing much more than that. Where you see people doing what we would call maybe a chip seal or a millet fill, where they just kind of take off the top layer and put down, you know, a, an inch or two of asphalt, we should be doing a complete rehabilitation or rebuild. But the lack of dollars in the system doesn't allow us to do that to the extent that we need. But how do we compare, right? So fancy slide here, little graphics. <laughs> Takes a little while to get to last, but that's where we're at. Right? So when we talk about how much we invest per capita in this state, we're dead last dead last in the country. And so if you can just imagine what investing the least amount of money does, chances are your road network suffers as a result. But how does that compare to surrounding states? Because a lot of people want to know that. So what do those other Midwest states look like around us? Well, you can, you can clearly see those that are around us are investing more. But what do those numbers represent? I'd like to point to Ohio, right? Because Ohio has a very similar road network to us, about the same number of miles. Right? They invest more per capita, but that results in roughly a billion more dollars each year into their system. Everybody been to Ohio? Seen their roads, right? Notice the difference when we cross the state line. And so that's what you see that investment doing. So when you look at us putting about $1.2 billion more dollars into this uh, network with the proposal that's before us here next week, that's essentially where we would end up. We would be more on par with Ohio. We would be investing a billion more dollars on an annual basis into our network and essentially building a system that's going <coughs> to allow for economic development, people to move, goods to move, and other things. And this is a chart. Don't worry about the details on the chart so much, but I want to point out to you, because this chart represents what happens if we do nothing. What happens if we continue at our current investment level and I'd like to point out the bottom line, the purple line, right? Because that's our local roads. Right now, our local roads are still about 77% in fair to good condition. But that leaves us with about 25% that are in poor condition. But if we continue on the current trend and with the lack of investment that's happened previously, that curve starts to drop off quite steep. And when we look at about a decade from now, 
with no further investment, we will have only about 30% of our roads in our local system. So the ones you drive on, your neighborhood streets, the ones you use to go to the grocery store, about 30% will be in good condition if we don't invest more. But I think this is, this, this is important here to talk to you about the history. So when I kind of let off, this isn't a proposal that just kind of came about in the middle of the night. Governor Snyder in, in 2013 laid out his plan in his State of the State address. He wanted to raise registration fees. He wanted to raise gas taxes. If you remember back that far, the registration fees got labeled as the birthday tax. So when they got labeled, because, you know, they come in on your birthday, right? That's what they're doing. Yeah, labeled as a birthday tax. As soon as that happened, that tax ta tax was essentially dead on arrival, right? And it left us with gas taxes to be discussed. And so the legislature did just that. So for those of you that are thinking that the issue wasn't discussed, they spent the entire year of 2013 talking about different ways in which to fund roads, <coughs> what the conditions of those roads were, and what would happen if we did nothing, right? So in 2014. We saw the first movement on legislation. Started in the House, right? And they moved over a package of bills to the Senate that kind of reallocated some current state dollars to the tune of about $450 million. Really didn't provide the significant investment that we needed. It took from other areas and did provide new revenue and a sustainable source. But they recognized it was a starting point, and the House kind of challenged the Senate and said, you know what, make it better. We challenge you to make it better, come up with a different proposal. And the Senate did just that. Unfortunately, in June, they couldn't find the votes for it to pass. But what they did was they said, we're going to change the model in which we charge our gas tax, so a cents per gallon, which we charge now, so everybody when they pay and purchase gas pays 19 cents per gallon. Right? We're going to go to a model that's based on the wholesale price. It's complicated, don't get me wrong. But it's a better way to calculate it in a model that's being done across this country now. It allows us to deal with fluctuations in gas prices much, much more efficiently. So we all see, right, we'll fill up on a Tuesday, it's like 224, and you're happy you got gas on Tuesday because on Wednesday it's like 250. Right? So we all got lucky on Tuesday, those that bought gas on Wednesday, they're in trouble. But because gas fluctuates like that, we had to find a more sustainable model for being a predictor in how we do that, and that's charging uh, the, 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 the tax on, on the wholesale uh, percentage level. But when they couldn't get it out in June, they kind of said, we got to continue discussion, and it's going to come back in lame duck because, as we know, everybody in this room, I think, voted for Representative Moss in the background, and many people were busy out there on the election cycle. So when they came back in lame duck, the Senate was able to pass that. It was a $1.5 billion tax increase solely based on hiking the gas tax. Would have been about a $0.25 cent increase in gas tax. The House got that back and they said, hey, well, we asked you to make it better, but we didn't ask you to make it like that. And so they came back and they said, well, we're going to come up with another plan now. And the House plan, which is now commonly referred to as the Bolger plan, interactive portion here. Anybody here in the Bolger plan? Oh, a couple people in the crowd, okay. Got a couple readers out here. But the Bolger plan wanted to do a couple of things. It wanted to try, try and solve the problem without raising taxes, which is nearly impossible to do. And the way that it was going to do that is we charge sales tax at the pump right now. So for every gallon of gasoline that you purchase, we have to pay sales tax on that gallon of gas. <coughs> that sales tax does not go to the road. Constitutionally, it goes to schools and local government. But the public has said time and time again, we want all of the taxes that we pay at the pump to go to our roads. <laughs> and in order to alleviate that problem, they wanted to exempt sales tax from the pump. Well, when you exempt sales tax from the pump, what happens? You create a hole in the budgets of schools and local government. It's a $600 million hole to schools it's a $75 million hole to local governments. Right? So when we talk about whether or not the legislature should or shouldn't have done the proposal that you have before us, and maybe they should have just done their job, or did they just punt it to the people, the fact that we create that hole by eliminating sales tax at the pump really puts us in a position that the only way 
you can guarantee that those funds are made up to schools and local government is to go and ask the people to raise the sales tax because the legislature cannot do that independently. Only the people can raise the sales tax. The legislature can put it on the ballot. So when we say, well, did the legislature do their job? The 92 yes votes that got in the House and the 26 <coughs> yes votes that got in the Senate were for a tax increase, right? But to affirm that tax increase, the public has to be involved because they cannot do it independently on their own. But how did they get to that point? Because, as I had mentioned, the support was not there in the House to raise the gas tax. The support was not there for what has commonly been referred to as the Bolger Plan. So legislative leaders and the governor sat down for about two weeks during the lame duck session and came up with what we now have as Proposal 1. And as I had mentioned, 92 votes in the House, 26 in the Senate, that's bipartisan support, right? And so this plan received bipartisan support, but the details are what we really care about. So a long roundabout way to tell you that the legislature just didn't shirk their responsibilities to get to this point, but here were the goals that they had in mind. We all recognize we need new revenue for roads. Very difficult to do it with existing state, state resources. We had to make sure, as I had mentioned, the Bolger Plan, which potentially would have made cuts to school and local governments, we had to make sure we protected uh, those budgets. Transportation taxes going to transportation. That's the issue of exempting sales tax from the pump that they wanted to make sure that they took care of. Maintaining competitive gas prices, because this is one of the things that the people care about. How much is my gas price going to go up? So if we look at a $2.50 gallon of gas right now, if this proposal was to pass, it would go to about 256. It's about six to eight cents difference in the price of the pump. You just have to remember we're paying an increased sales tax, right? But there is a small increase in the price of the pump. And sales tax is typically considered a regressive tax. So we had to make sure we provided tax relief, or one of their goals was to provide tax relief to low income individuals across the state. If they did that through the restoration of the earned income tax credit. So in 2011, when Snyder took office, he cut the earned income tax credit from 20% of the federal level down to 6% of the federal level. So this plan will actually restore that tax credit. And so let's look at it uh, from the perspective of a family with, a, with, with two parents right, and two children. Both those parents working a minimum wage job, they make about thirty-four dollars to $35,000 a year working full time. When you think about the impact of this tax on them, after they pay an increased sales tax, after they pay a small increase of the gas tax, with the restoration of the EITC, they will actually have about $177 more dollars in their pocket. The other extreme of that is a single parent with two kids working a minimum wage job making about $15,000 a year, they will have just over $600 more in their pocket as a result of this. So although it is regressive, they tried to take steps that were necessary to kind of lessen the impact on those individuals. Now, I'm not going to try and hide the fact at all that this is a tax increase. So there are some out there that will spend more. So if we kind of look at a middle income wage earner, depending on what study you read, but the numbers that we like to typically use is that for a middle income wage earner between the average income of about forty and sixty thousand dollars, this will be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four hundred dollars more per year. And so that's nothing to sneeze at, right? And that's something that at, at, at the municipal league we take very serious and how it impacts our residents because we are acutely aware that we want to make sure we keep people in this state and not watch them leave this state. You know, so we, we were very concerned about that impact. But what we also look at this, this is, is an investment moving forward. So you can't have something for nothing, right? And so you have to make sure that if we're going to make an investment, it's going to go where we say it's going to go. And we'll talk about that in just a second because I think that's a big question as well. But very quickly, I want to make sure we just separate the two issues. There's the ballot language which is out there which raises the sales tax by a penny. Remember, that money actually does not go to the roads. That's the money... Pardon me? Not a penny for percentage. Well, I, I, I understand that, but the sales tax is going from six cents to seven cents, so it's increasing by one penny. If it's two dollars, it's fourteen cents. Three dollars, eighteen. I, I understand, sir. Thank you. So, so it's not a penny. So as as we look at this, that's actually there to make sure that we backfill those dollars that are lost to schools and local government. 
It's the statutory changes that will actually bring in new revenue for roads. And that's the change in that model to the gas tax that I discussed earlier. Now, there's also changes to vehicle registration fees. So the question is, is my vehicle registration fee going to go up? If you drive a heavy truck, 26,000 pounds and heavier, yes, vehicle registration fees are going up on the heaviest vehicles we have on the road. On your individual vehicle, it will hold consistent as to where it is now. So it's not a vehicle registration increase. What we are doing is we are eliminating the depreciation that happens the first three years of a purchase of a new vehicle. If you actually own or drive a vehicle that is four years or older, which is about 80% of the population, you will be unimpacted by this change. But if you drive a new vehicle, purchase a new vehicle, or have a vehicle that is in the middle of the depreciation schedule, you will not realize that 10% depreciation. You will be held flat where you are now, but nothing will go up where you will be paying more. Transportation-related reform. <laughs> There will be increased competitive bidding on projects of $100,000 or more and warranties on projects of $1 million or more. And that was the idea of trying to make sure that the road builder was responsible for anything that failed and not the general public. And then the restoration of the earned income tax credit, as I talk about, I always like to remind people that we get to vote a week from tomorrow, no matter how you're going to vote. I think it's very, very important that you do that and you take part in this process. So what are the effects on revenue? We know sales tax brings in about $1.34 billion, but not all of that will be realized because we're exempting sales tax from the pump. So you lose some of that revenue. The statutory changes bring in about $1.2 for roads uh, on the motor fuel cost, $95 million from those registration fees that I mentioned, but you actually lose some of the tax increase because of the tax credit that's going out to low-income individuals. So the net impact is <coughs> $1.2 billion more dollars for roads. We're going to have just over $100 million more dollars into the Comprehensive Transportation Fund, which is public transit primarily. School aid, $300 million more. Constitutional revenue sharing, just short of $100 million. Uh, the general fund actually in the first year received zero benefit. It actually cost them some dollars, and that's primarily due to the fact that the earned income tax credit uh, it has a net impact of uh, $260 million to the negative. And since I'm in Southfield, I wanted to put up the effects just you know, specifically to this population. And I know the representative represents more than just this city. But just so you can see here, Southfield right now in road funding gets about $5.1 million. As this plan gets fully implemented, and I'll touch on this in just a second, you're going to see an additional $3.3 million on an annual basis directly into the city of Southfield's road network. It's a 66% increase. Right? Constitutional revenue sharing, which comes out of that $100 million or more for schools and local government, they're going to get a 12% increase or almost $700,000 uh, more into their municipal budget. And this is uh, something that I want to talk about very quickly because there have been some questions out there about why are we paying down MDOT debt in this proposal. So over the first two years, right, in the first year you're going to make an $800 million debt payment to MDOT. In the second year you're going to make a $400 million debt payment to MDOT. Those are on bonds that were taken out in 1997 under Build Michigan. So when we raised the gas tax last time, we got very aggressive and we borrowed money to do more road projects. Well, we're still paying for that. And we're still paying it to the tune of just over $200 million a year. So if we look at our credit card, right, if you think about making that credit card payment, do you want to make the minimum payment for 10 years, or would you prefer to pay that off very quickly in two? Because what it does is it frees up capital, right, and allows you to spend it on other things, and it saves you money in the long run. And that's essentially what this does here. So as we make that debt payment, we will actually free up capital and reduce our annual obligation by over $100 million. And what we actually save from this is about $1.5 billion over the course of those bonds, and that $1.5 billion gets put directly back into our roads. So it can't go to anything else, right? It's part of that transportation revenue that I discussed, and gets put right back into the system. And so that's a good thing, we believe. The other reason that they phased this in over the first three years 
is because of the workforce in Michigan needs to ramp up. Right now, you could handle $1.2 billion worth of projects. The problem is, is cost would go up, right? Supply and demand. So there's a lot of demand, but very little supply of workers, and it'll drive that price up. So this allows kind of a three-year time period in which to balance the workforce with the dollars that are in. And I know the representative is going to talk about some, some frequently asked questions that he's seen, but I want to touch on a couple of things that we hear a lot. And the first is, because we're involved in this very directly, is special interest. So it's that extra that's part of this package beyond the $1.2 billion. And that extra is schools, local government, public transit, and low-income working families in this state. Now, I mean, I, I don't think that everything that I think is true is true. But in this case, I do not look at, I know many others do not look at, the schools that educate our kids, Southfield that helps provide safe drinking water, you know, the bus that helps get an individual to a doctor's appointment, to their job, to whatever it may be as a special interest. Or that family that is doing everything that they can to help put food on the table, uh, going to work, working 40 plus hours a week as a special interest. Isn't there enough money in the state budget? And I, and I know the representative is going to talk about this and he deals with it. He's learning very quickly how much money there actually is in the state budget that's discretionary. So the headline is, is that the state budget is $54 billion. It's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. But, uh, but of that, $44 billion of it is either federal funds or state funds that we have to use to draw down those federal funds. And if you don't use those state funds to draw down that money, you lose federal dollars. So it's very important that we do that to get the maximum amount of return that we can get from Washington. So that leaves us with about a $10 billion discretionary budget. And I went through it and I did the math, and I can read it right off the chart at, you know, later on if you would like me to, but I'm just going to give you the highlight of it. The governor in his budget laid out 26 items or 26 departments or parts of departments that are funded by that $10 billion. <coughs> you could eliminate general fund spending to 16 of those, and if you did that, and you took that money and put it into the roads, that would give you the $1.2 billion. So what is included in those 16 state areas that we fund? Community colleges, <coughs> Department of Ag, <coughs> Department of Natural Resources, the Attorney General, Treasury's Operating Budget, Military and Veterans Affairs, License and Regulatory Reform, and so on, as you, as you can tell. The core services <coughs> that the state helps provide, we fund. So if you really want to cut from state government, you're going to have to make a very, very tough decision on what is and what isn't the right thing to cut. Those other ten departments that are out there, those include things like corrections, right, school aid, Department of Human Services, Department of Community Health, all things that provide core functions, again, to our citizens and our communities. So very difficult to do. What are the guarantees? Because I, I think this is a very, very important question here. Because you want to know that if you're going to vote yes on this, and we're going to raise your taxes, money's going to go where they say it's going to go, right? Because I think, and at times I'm probably guilty of this, we don't necessarily trust government to the fullest extent. And they've given us good reason to at times. Right? But there's two key factors here that really allow me to stand before you and tell you very honestly that this money will go where they say it's going to go. First and foremost, on the sales tax side, it's the Constitution. The Constitution right now is very specific that any sales tax dollars outside of the two cents that goes for Proposal A in 94, but the remaining balance of that, which is currently four, it would be five cents under this proposal, 60% of that has to go to schools, 15% has to go to local government. Right? And that's not changing. That's been consistent. And the Constitution <coughs> guarantees that that happens. Right? You can't change it. The legislature can't go in and do something different. Right? So that's the guarantee. But the big one is transportation. Right? How do we know that that money is actually going to end up on our roads? Is it going to go there? And what says that it will? Article 9, Section 9 of the Constitution. I always carry a copy of it so nobody thinks I'm lying. But Article 9, Section 9 of the Constitution says... When we look at our fuel taxes that are paid at the pump, at least, at least 90% has to go to roads and bridges. 
the remaining balance of that goes into the comprehensive transportation fund, right? And that's public transit. So every dollar that will be at the increased pump price, right? That, that increased tax at the pump will go to roads. The director of the department has to certify that that happens every single year. And so our guarantee that those dollars will go where you say they're going to go is right there in the Constitution. <coughs> and then I kind of already addressed uh, the legislature, I'll let you beat up on the legislator, who wasn't there in his defense, uh, but why maybe they did some of that and why those decisions were made. And the only one I don't have up here is no plan B, right? And I'm sure we'll get that question. And so is there or is there not a plan B? And I'll, I'll address that in, in two very quick ways before I turn it over to the representative. Here's what I can guarantee you today, right? I can guarantee you today that on May 5th, if you vote in favor of this, we have found a solution, right? It may not be a perfect solution, and I'm not going to stand here before you and tell you that it is, but it is a solution. The other thing that I can guarantee for you is that there is no guaranteed plan after May 6th or May 5th. Nobody can stand here before you, the representative can't stand here before you and guarantee you that something will happen, right? And that's kind of what we have to look at, right? And so there are proposals out there, there are things that are out there, but... You have to have the votes to get it done. Nothing has been produced that would actually receive the votes in the same fashion that Proposal 1 did, and that's why we say there's no Plan B uh, and a very difficult uh, look at how this problem will be solved should it not pass on May 5th. So. Okay. Uh, Pam, we're gonna, you have a question specific to this presentation. I'm going to do right now, uh, I have a PowerPoint of some frequently asked questions I've heard, and if it's not one of those questions, we'll go to you for a question after that. Well, I do have a question. Okay. Fire away. Why, Go ahead. why is it that every time there's an election, um, these laws or proposals seem to use all the buzzwords, and I'm sick and tired of it, buzzwords like safer roads, safe water, kids in school. It seems like the concern is only there when you need something done. Why isn't the concern there before you have it on the ballot? I'm telling people to vote no, and for all the reasons that I'm going to hopefully get a chance to sure. say why this is not a good thing for the state of Michigan. Yeah, I mean, I, I can answer it one way. Actually, I think Jeremy, excuse me, Representative Moss, is a little, little more apt to handle that from the legislative side. I, from our organization standpoint, we do care, but you have to understand the position that we were put in as an organization because we don't get to vote on the proposal. Right? We don't get to hit the green button when it's up you know, on the House or the Senate floor. And like I mentioned, we had advocated for them to do something different. But when we look at where we're at today and where we are going forward, I think we have many of the same concerns that you have. But we have to look at, the, look at what is actually before us. And as a result of that, that's why we started uh, to get into this process of looking at it from our board level and ultimately decided to support it. Also knowing the fact that should it fail, we can't guarantee anything happens. And so we wanted to get behind something that we thought represented a solution, maybe not been our perfect solution or what we had asked for throughout the advocacy process, uh, but at the same time does represent a solution and something that we had to make a decision on and our decision was to support. Yeah, one more question? Yes. If you're advocating for change, why don't you advocate that we start using the European method of building mm -hmm. roads. Yeah, so it lasts much longer. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, why don't you advocate for reduction of inmates? We pay $36,000 a year to keep a guy in prison for having four joints. That's utterly absurd. Well, I, I know corrections reform is a hot topic in the legislature right now. In terms of the European model, not that we have anything <coughs> against it, and I think there has been some, you know, proven statistically that they do last longer. The problem is they are much more expensive to build. And so when things are more expensive to build, you still have to have the revenues to do that right away, and that's what doesn't exist currently. So, and, and to, be, to be very honest with you, this proposal is not going to give you the type of revenue needed to build the European standard. And I'll answer the corrections aspect. Um, it talks about, you know, what's in the state budget. Most of the money 
uh, that the, the largest bud part of the budget that we vote on, most of the money that's in the budget that I vote on, is the Department of Corrections. Because probably about 20 years ago, the state legislature changed the sentencing guidelines to require, and we have prosecutors here, to require the uh, minimum mandatory sentence. So yeah, our prison population spikes. Um, and that's a huge issue um, that we need to look at and address. Um, I agree with you on that one. We have a huge problem with uh, with a spike in our prison population because of the changing of the sentence guidelines and the and the inflexibility that we've given our judges. But I do want to shift right now to some frequently asked questions. Many of you were at a uh, previous coffee hour that I had on, on road funding, so some of these questions came from that. Um, so what John and I are, are attempting to do is really dissect what's in Proposal 1. It's, um, it's difficult to uh, give you any sense of an alternative for Proposal 1. That's why we're focusing what's on Proposal 1. It's tough to focus on what are some alternatives because this is not one of those ballot initiatives where we can either vote for A or we can vote for B. Either we're voting for Proposal 1, which is your, you know, your personal decision at the ballot box whether or not to do, but there is no, if we d vote against Proposal 1, this is the secondary option. So that's why we're spending so much energy and time detailing what's in the proposal as opposed to talking about alternatives because as it stands right now, this is an all or nothing vote and if this vote fails and if that's your, uh, your right as a, as a voter to vote against it, then the conversation begins anew about what's the alternative. So that's why we're diving so deep on what's in Proposal 1 rather than talking about what are alternatives because don't, no concrete alternatives exist as of yet. So I'm going to talk about some frequently asked questions um, that I've heard. What exactly is the funding problem with our roads? So John had a very similar slide, and this is 90%, this red line represents 90% uh, of our roads being in good or fair condition. Uh, this timeline began in the 1990s, and it goes up to a projected 2025. So we're about right here at this cusp, uh, and the roads, you know, are, are reaching that 90% peak of good uh, and fair uh, condition. And if we continue the same funding formula uh, that we have today, this is what happens to the conditions of our roads. It doesn't just, you know, somehow uh, decrease at a, at a steady rate. It plummets. And it goes to that 30% uh, of our roads are in good condition, that same number that John highlighted before. So there's just no doubt the funding stream that we have going to our roads is not sustainable. It's just not. Uh, so what is the funding problem? First is that Michigan has the lowest highway investment per person out of all of the Great Lakes states. And that current revenue sources dedicated toward transportation, which is mainly the fuel and vehicle res registration taxes, they're insufficient to maintain the state's road system to continue in that good or fair condition. So can't we just make cuts elsewhere? Um, that's, uh, that's been a proposed uh, alternative. Uh, a plan B said, you know, if we need to raise $1.3 billion annually, can't we just find money in a $50 billion budget to make the cuts? So this is what the state budget actually looks like that, that I will vote on. We're starting to vote into the state budget. We're voting on some bills this week. Um, we, our fiscal year starts on October 1, but we will probably finish up the budget process by summer. So this is what's in the state budget. Uh, you have federal dollars that come in that we don't have control over. You have uh, some local uh, pieces to the budget, some private uh, pieces to the budget. And then this is a huge state restricted fund. A lot of it is what's in the Constitution. You know, what parts of the budget come in constitutionally that I can't change as a legislator, only we can change by voting on it. So that's, that's another $20 billion that's restricted. So we're only talking about, as a state legislature, we only vote on what happens with this $10 billion. So yeah, it's about a $52 billion budget, but the pieces that we can uh, place into allocating funds is only about $10 billion of that portion, um, and most of it actually goes towards Department of Corrections. Uh, and now the governor has merged the Department of Community Health and the Department of uh, Human Services to create uh, one department, the Department of Health and Human Services. That makes up a big portion of this uh, $10 billion budget that we can actually work with. And it's tough to be able to say, you know, we're going to be cutting corrections uh, in favor of roads or we're going to be cutting um, health and human services in favor of roads. So given the fact that our roads are going to be plummeting in their condition, 
Given the fact that we have such a restricted amount of money that we're dealing with, we had to figure out a way to raise the revenue. Um, so can't we just make cuts elsewhere? 80% of the budget is funded by restricted sources and other obligations are the Department of Corrections, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so why are we voting on this? I think you know, that was explained, but I still get that question all the time. I hear that the legislature last year punted this toward the voters, didn't make a decision. Uh, that's true. There, there's no doubt they could have raised the revenue by uh, implementing new laws. But because this plan, this plan actually raises the sales tax, that formula is set in the state constitution. As a legislator, as a legislator I can't, uh, and none of my colleagues alone can change the state constitution. It has to be a vote of the public. So that's why we're voting on it, because a piece of this formula changes uh, the state constitution. And if we want to say that all the money that we pay at the pump goes toward transportation funding, uh, then the citizens have to vote on this. So why not just increase the taxes at the pump? I've, I've gotten that question a lot. You know, why, why are we doing this? Anything to do with the sales tax? Why don't we just have as close to a user fee as you can get, which would be if you pay more taxes for gasoline at the pump, that's going toward the roads that you drive your, your car on. Well, in the short of it, I kind of agree with that concept. It's much more direct. If we have to raise the revenue, um, perhaps we should strictly only raise it at the pump. That was a bipartisan plan that passed out of the Senate. Um, so that was part of the discussion, strictly raising taxes at the pump. One second, Pam. Uh, but the House Speaker at the time, uh, when it got over from the Senate back to the House, that plan was rejected. Um, it didn't have the votes in the House to pass. You have to get something that passes through the House and the Senate and then signed in the governor in order to become a law. And the House uh, rejected that plan. Uh, and instead proposed a plan that uh, cut the sales tax at the pump, and that sales tax doesn't go toward roads, that sales tax goes toward our local communities, that sales tax goes toward our schools. Um, so if you cut the sales tax at the pump, you're actually, for now with on city council, revenue sharing uh, that comes from the state, so the tax dollars that come from the state back to the local community, uh, and Myron Frazier can say it too, if we had an increase in revenue sharing on the city level, the first two things we would put the increase toward revenue sharing would be our local roads that the local communities are in charge of, and public safety. So for me, it didn't make sense to slash the sales tax that goes toward local communities because it actually hinders Southfield's ability to repair local roads. So you're finding some sort of funding mechanism that can help the state roads, but at the same time, you're hurting the locals. So maybe, you know, Telegraph might be uh, in chip-chop uh, condition, but your local road is going to be just as, as bad trying to get the Telegraph road. It, did just, it was a plan that didn't make sense to me. So what will, with the new taxes at the pump, how much will I pay? This is from the Michigan Department of Transportation. Uh, we are eliminating two taxes at the pump. We're eliminating the 19 cents uh, a gallon tax, that's a flat tax, and we're eliminating the 6% sales tax. By eliminating those two taxes, we're implementing a 14.9% wholesale tax that will be paid by gas station owners. Obviously, I mean, there's no doubt that that is going to uh, affect us as consumers as we pay for uh, gasoline at the pump. So we're eliminating two taxes, and we're implementing another tax. As a result, currently on, the, on $3 a gallon, we pay about $0.37 cents tax on that. Uh, with Proposal 1, uh, as John said, it's, it's a slight increase um, <coughs> but from $0.37 cents to an, on, on average for $3 a gallon to $0.41 cents on average for, for $3 a gallon. So another question I've heard is, you know, our sales tax will be the highest in the region or the highest in the country. That's not true. Uh, and this is from the Nonpartisan Tax Foundation. Uh, so this is uh, the average uh, local sales tax and average state sales tax rates around our Great Lakes region. Uh, currently we're at 6%. Obviously this boosts us up to uh, 7%. And you can see what the other states are here. Um, the highest is New York is at about 8.47%. Uh, the lowest is... Wisconsin at 5.3, but most of the others are around that $7 number. Um, so uh, we're still in the same uh, range as most of the other Great Lakes states. Should we decide, should this proposal move forward? Biggest question I get is, why are we doing anything with schools? We're trying to fix roads. 
Why are schools even a part of the equation? What this proposal intends to do is finally separate the tax dollars that you and I pay for schools to go to schools and the taxpayer dollars that you and I pay at the pump to go to roads. As I said, the 6% sales tax that we pay at the pump goes toward revenue sharing to our local communities and it goes toward school funding, a, a big portion of it. So, uh, proposal one, what it also does, because I think it has a list of about eight things on our ballot that it does, another thing that it does is it protects the school aid fund from being raided to fix roads. Currently, when, when the school aid fund operates at a surplus, they've been using those surplus dollars to put back into the general fund. Um, I have this feeling, this sense that uh, surplus education dollars are meant for education. Mm -hmm. So this allows for education dollars to go to schools and not to fix our roads, and it allows for taxes at the pump to go to roads and not back to our classrooms. So this, at long last, separates schools uh, from the taxes that we pay at the pump while not harming the taxes uh, that we need that go toward education. Why is the earned income tax a part of this proposal? Um, I think uh, uh, I've had a question at our last coffee hour. There's just too much in this. You know, this proposal has got you know so many moving parts. Why don't we just have a strict uh, pot of revenue that just goes toward roads? Well, if we're raising if we're raising the sales tax from six to seven percent, there's no doubt it's a regressive tax, and it, and it, and it affects uh, you know probably lower income people more so than anybody else. So in 2011, Governor Snyder did decrease the earned income tax credit uh, from 20% uh, to 6%. This boosts it back up to that 20% level that it was at and operating at uh, in 2011 and prior. So it's, it's a regressive tax. It's going to hurt our lowest income earners. We are providing those who work hard and are working members of society still are not able to make ends meet to uh, apply for the earned income tax credit. How can we guarantee that Proposal 1 will work? I think there's a lot of doubts here. Um, we've been burned by legislation before uh, that uh, promises one thing and doesn't deliver. But there is uh, absolute fact. Do it all the time. Absolute fact. Part of the reason that we're voting on this and not just the legislature voting on this is because we're changing the state constitution. And there is, this requires a vote of the public, and there's no stronger safeguard to this plan than by enshrining it in the state constitution. This is not a law that the legislature can defund. This is not a law that the legislature can do away with in two months. If this proposal uh, passes by the voters, it will require another vote of the public in order to undo it. So this is the safest, surest way that this funding formula can be protected is by enshrining the details of it in the state constitution. What's the backup plan if this fails? It's a blank slide because there is not a current backup plan. Um, I will tell you that there have been plans that have been floated around. One is to take the money from the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Fund I think we've heard a lot about auto no fault recently. Mitch Album had a great op-ed. Billions. Billions in there. But that, that money isn't for road repair. That money is for uh, people who, uh, any one of us who, God forbid, could, could use, utilize those dollars um, if, they, if they're suffering uh, from a traumatic brain injury as a result of a catastrophic accident. Um, that money also is not uh, accessible by the legislature. So that is a representative. You might have heard about that plan. We don't have access to those funds, uh, and those funds were never dedicated toward road funding. It was dedicated toward um, uh, catastrophic injuries that anybody, uh, unfortunately, could suffer. Another plan B that I've heard was this Bolger plan that, you know, will strictly eliminate uh, the taxes at the pump that don't go toward road funding and will implement taxes at the pump uh, to make sure that those are the ones that do go toward road funding. But as I said earlier, that would threaten the vitality of our schools. That would threaten the vitality of our local communities if we did not make up those dollars somehow. If we didn't 100% constitutionally protect and backfill those dollars that we eliminate at the pump. And again, just to completely stress this point, coming from the city council level, 
it doesn't make sense to me to slash revenue sharing for our local communities because if we had an increase in revenue sharing on the Southfield City Council level, we would put those dollars most likely in two places, local roads and public safety. So again, if you slash revenue sharing, you're now threatening the condition of your, of your local roads. Um, those are some of the frequently asked questions that I've heard, uh, but now I'm going to open it up uh, to you. I think Jason will walk around with a microphone and, and anything else, um, you know, John, John can dive in and answer. I'm happy to dive in and answer. Um, again, I just wanted to also reiterate the reason we spent so much time about what's in Proposal 1 is because right now there's not an alternative. So we wanted to make sure that you had every bit of detail about what's in Proposal 1 before you make a decision one way or another. Um, because uh, on May 6th, should this vote fail, uh, we'll find out, what we'll, we'll advocate for what the alternative proposal is. I'll bring uh, that information to all of you uh, as it comes out. Uh, but this is the details should the plan pass, and should the plan not pass, we'll have another one of these because there's going to be another uh, opportunity for all of us to kind of see what's coming forward. So I'll give the microphone to Jason. I saw Pam's hand first. Um, I see Fred up there in the back. Harmon, we'll, we'll get to everybody. Again, I'm asking people to vote no. This is where the Michiganders have been duped and bamboozled. There's a constitution uh, a statement that says libraries are supposed to be are supposed to be funded to a certain percentage. We know that libraries across the state of Michigan are not being funded according to what's in the Constitution. So to say we're concerned about kids and education, I think that's an understatement. Another thing is none of these communities got the shared revenue. So if the shared revenue was given with uh, any kind of integrity, we wouldn't have needed a 2011 public safety military that, again, we were duped and bamboozled on. We would not have needed the 2014 bond proposal for $99 million. I just think for me being a Michigander, I am proposal initiate, initiative uh, milliged out because they do not do what they say that they're going to do. Now, I like the idea of the money coming out of the catastrophic fund, the catastrophic fund because it is over a billion dollars. I'm not finished reading the information, but I was given some information about when you get into a car accident in the state of Michigan, it's supposed to be lifetime on medical. Well, if you look at the trend that they have um, started or that's been going on since this fund started, they basically only pay your bills for about four years. After that, you run into a situation where the insurance company won't pre-approve it and the hospitals won't let you incur the bill without the pre-approval. So that's how they get you. I'm just asking people to vote no. Let the people come up with another creative way to raise the money and go get it from Lear and Denzo and all of these big companies that have been given tax abatements that didn't deserve it. This is a time for you to cash in on your relationship with those companies and let them pay for it. Private donations. Okay, uh, two things to that, Pam. Um, thank you. Uh, th no, thank you for your question and your thoughts. The two things I would say most to that is you mentioned that they've been cutting revenue sharing toward our communities anyway. That's true. No, and they haven't given what's owed to well, the that's, community. Well, that's true. That is in the statutory revenue sharing. So that's what I talked about, you know. Statutory revenue sharing is by state law. Constitutional revenue sharing is by state constitution. Mm -hmm. They have, they cannot, the legislature cannot slash revenue sharing that is constitutional. It has been rating revenue sharing that is statutory. That's why it, this plan changes the constitution so that me, anybody else in the legislature cannot touch it from this point moving forward. This boosts the constitutional revenue sharing that cannot be rated, touched, diminished by the state legislature. And number two, the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Fund, again, the state doesn't have access to those dollars. Those dollars are designated um, should any of us get into a, a catastrophic accident um, and, 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 and require the, you know, medical treatment and medical care as a part of their insurance. Um, so we don't, yeah, we don't, we don't have access to that to but those to, to take for the road. They're not but using the, the reserve. That's why it's over it's billions it, and billions but, of dollars but, in that fund. But that was, that's that a proposal. Sick, you've got people with closed head injuries sure. that are in wheelchairs that require a lot of information. 
uh, in terms of their care, and their parents have to fight for it. But we don't so have access to that. The fund is there, we don't have and the insurance company can it's give it if they a, need it. Why are they not, not giving it to them? It's not a state fund that we can If they don't want to give it, then charge them a tax on it for holding on it. We'll go to Harmon now. And then Fred, you'll be next. <laughs> okay. I mailed this to you. you it. Yes, you did. Good. I'm back. I hope you read it. In 2011, Schneider and his cohorts gave corporations 1.7 billion tax cuts. Mm -hmm. To pay for that 1.7 billion tax cut to corporations, they took money away from schools, joint income credit, community funding. If you go back and you send that tax cut and have the corporations pay for it, there's your core funding. Uh, I'm getting a little bit nervous because I want to get this right. Okay, I'm going to do that. The Michigan Municipal League survey found that cuts in the revenue sharing have negatively impacted basic community services across Michigan, <coughs> including postponing street and sidewalk repairs, sewer and water improvements. Associate Director of the Michigan Municipal League, Anthony Minghain, calls the cuts to Michigan's greatest revenue sharing heist mm. and says that the amount of money the state stole from local communities would even make the convicted Ponzi schemers Burning that off, taking the risk. Yeah, there is municipal league. The associate director agreed. This is a Ponzi scheme, by the purported by our legislature. They are making us, the average citizen, the middle income, pay for their corporate greed. Thank you. No, thanks, Harmon. I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to answer this without uh, getting so hyperpartisan because it's not, I'm not here to create this hyperpartisan conversation, but there's a lot of truth in what you said. And if we had votes in the legislature to roll back those tax break giveaways to the largest corporations, I would be uh, happy to advocate for that plan. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, the legislature is not uh, controlled by a majority that would do that. Um, and, you know, I think across the state, people want to make sure that Republicans and Democrats work together and stop the fighting and stop the argument. Proposal 1 was a result of all people coming to the table. Uh, Democrats got some stuff in there that they wanted and gave concessions. Republicans got some stuff that they wanted in there and gave concessions. This is a result of, I, of the process of communication and negotiation, everything working. If you, if I'm, if I'm May 6th, you know this doesn't, uh, this doesn't pass. Um, I, I will, I will be happy to advocate uh, for rolling back, you know, those, those tax breaks at the top. And I will be happy to call Governor Snyder along with you and everybody else in our community. But the reality is, is that you know there's a set of wishes and wants, mm -hmm. and then there's the hand that we have that we're dealing with right now. I'm with you on the wishes and wants. The reality is, is that uh, we have proposal one as a result of the, what could have been passed and what was passed out of the legislature. <coughs> I don't know how to answer that better than that. Um, I'm not here to throw partisan bombs, but I don't disagree with the sentiment behind what Harmon said, but that's not the reality of where the legislature is right now. Uh, I saw Fred's hand was up. Yeah, oh, John wants to chime Just to... to to slide in there just because I mean, you mentioned you know the article that we put out. It's something we firmly believe in, but what that gets to is the heart of what the representative was just talking about, the difference between what is constitutional revenue, revenue sharing and what is statutory revenue sharing. That article there was purely based on a statutory revenue sharing formula that should have put more dollars into our local communities across the state, and it's absolutely ridiculous that they have not funded our communities to the way that they said they would have. Yeah. And it has cost cities and villages all across the state, everywhere from as far as you can get in the southeast corner all the way to Iron Mountain in the UP. And it has had devastating effects on our communities. And they should be funding it. But what Representative Moss talks about is right on. Wishes and wants versus reality. And it's very unfortunate that we're, we're where we are today and we will, as an organization, continue to battle and continue to advocate for the restoration of every single statutory 
dollar that we can get. But going forward, locking things in the Constitution for us is something that we very, very rarely get an opportunity to do, and it does help provide and put our communities maybe not on the most stable ground, but more stable ground, and that's very important to us. Okay, we'll go to Fred, and then we'll work our way around the room. I see you, Matt. We'll go around. Uh, as, good evening, Mr. Marsh. Hi, Fred. How are you? As a resident of Southfield, and knowing that we've voted on this bond issue, does what the state is doing really involve us? Don't we have enough money with our bond issue to deal with our roads? And Michigan sure. can go where they need to, but as Southfield residents, we addressed this issue a while ago. Just before we heard about this statewide issue, I believe we were misled in Southfield in believing that the bond issue was our only hope to fix roads, and then suddenly this proposal shows up statewide. So we jumped the gun by approving the bond proposal, I believe, and as a beneficiary, if you will, of this catastrophic insurance due to a severe head injury 11 years ago, I haven't seen any of this money. And it's like Ms. Gerald spoke of, these insurance companies run the show, not the state of Michigan available to comprehend your injury and offer you compassion. They give it out to the insurance companies. And your own insurance company I had to sue just to deal with the medical costs, which they argue with me every day in this lifelong protection they're supposed to provide. I'm not getting it. So if that catastrophic fund is being used as it has been to deny me benefits, we might as well use it to fix the roads. Because exactly. the roads annoy me with a head injury more than, <laughs> you know. I thank you for your time. Thank I, you, Fred. I'd like to believe things can happen that are promised, but it's mostly wishes I've seen be turned into forgotten thoughts as wishes that would have improved this city have been thrown into the gutter. And we proceed business as usual. There's a tax abatement and a brownfield tax grant tonight at the council meeting, two months after we agreed discrimination was illegal. We're providing two more beneficiaries of tax breaks that increase our tax obligation as residents when they deplete our public funding. All right, Fred, our I, tax I, I wanna, and brownfield tax grants I want to be still discriminate. Of everybody else, too. So I, mean, I will answer your the, the question the that you just posed. meeting and demand this council sure. explain why. Fred, give me, uh, an opportunity, please Fred, continue. give me an opportunity to answer the question. Thank um, you. So Fred brought up this local road millage, or ro local road bond proposal that we uh, passed in Southfield last year. That's because the city of Southfield itself is in charge without any state funding whatsoever in providing services to your local neighborhood roads. Uh, and because of the slashes in revenue sharing from the state, which could have helped fund some of those projects, but we and city council always budgeted assuming that the revenue sharing wasn't going to be there because it was being slashed, we did ask the voters uh, to approve of an 11-year, uh, $99 million bond. That money will touch, and there's a map, map on the city website, I hope it's still up there, that map, with those, that money will touch just about every single local neighborhood in the city of Southfield from years 1 through 6, or 1 through 5, and then years 6 through 11. So that money goes to your local neighborhood road. Proposal 1 wouldn't touch that. Proposal 1 touches the state trunk line, which is the major roads that go throughout our community. But on City Council, we said consistently, if there was money that came in from the state, we would not go all the way with that $99 million bond. You gave us the option to do that, but the city said from the front end, we wouldn't go all the way with that bond. So what this does is this adds about $3.3 million more dollars uh, in road funding coming to Southfield, but it also increases our revenue sharing that we get from the state. That can, that, and I've talked to our city administrator here in Southfield, that can backfill some of the money from that $99 million bond uh, that the city council has the opportunity to go all the way with and, and won't. So, again, Fred was talking about local road <coughs> millage, which is not affected by Proposal 1 directly. Matt. Uh, yes, thank you, Red Boss. Absolutely. And, uh, your guest speaker showed a graph with all the different states and what their per capita in, uh, contribution to our goals was. Curiously absent, he did not mention or show the fact that these other states do not allow the same heavy truck loads that our state suffers with. And it's 
some cases it's twice the limit that these other states have. I uh, got wise to this when I was working and traveled down I-75 when it was being rebuilt. Three years later, as I traveled it again, <coughs> the exact same spots where the potholes and breakdowns were, were back on the road again. When will the legislature stiffen its backbone and stand up against the trucking industry to lower our weight restrictions to that of the other states? Why are we putting money down the drain year after year after year only to have our roads crumble? Guarantees notwithstanding, the roads are still going to be broken up. Thank you. Thanks, Max, for your question. So, as I said, this proposal was this negotiated piece of Republicans not getting everything they wanted but getting some things in it, Democrats not getting everything they wanted and getting some pieces in it. So among the things that the Democrats did act, ask for was the earned income tax restoration uh, and the protection of the school aid fund. Among the things that Republicans did not want in this package was an increase on the fees and fines and, and the lowering uh, of, or the increasing the weight limits for these trucks for the trucking industry. So that, that's why that wasn't in the final proposal. House leadership didn't want it. But one of the very first bills that has been introduced uh, this legislative session was from Representative Marilyn Lane. She's out of Macomb County. She is the Democratic Vice Chairwoman of the House <coughs> Transportation Committee. And what her bill does is it, uh, it fixes the weight limits so that we don't have these heavy trucks bouncing up and down our, our roads, and it, uh, it increases uh, fines uh, for those who, who uh, 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 violate uh, those weight limits. I would be incredibly supportive of that bill. So that's been reintroduced this session. It's not part of, and then uh, John can take uh, further into that, but that's not directly for part of this, a part of this proposal, uh, but it's coming in as a separate piece this legislative session. Yeah. It, it, it was part of kind of the initial discussion last year. It actually did receive a vote in the state Senate and failed uh, in the Senate. But it, not to advocate for or against uh, raising or lowering the truck weights, but just to give you know, some statistical background on that and really kind of what that represents. And, and, and there's a variety of ways in which it, it gets explained. But, but in very simple terms, trucks most likely do more damage to the roads. But the majority of the trucks that we see out there, you know, kind of the 18 wheelers, the five axle weights, those are 80,000 pounds or less. What we're really talking about is the difference between 80,000 pounds and what we have at 164,000 pounds. So how many vehicles are that are, are those, or, or, or how many vehicles are there on our roads that are actually falling into that category? And it's less than 5% of all truck traffic that we have in this state. <coughs> and primarily, that traffic actually happens in the UP. And it happens, and this is the reason why uh, many decades ago we were grandfathered into the 164,000 pound weight category in this state is because of the logging industry. And so when we talk about what those trucks actually represent in this state, it's a small percentage and the majority of them are actually up north because of the logging industry. So uh, in order to, to reduce that, and other states do allow heavy vehicles. They just charge differently for them. Because the one thing that you will see here in Southeast Michigan that gets up into that 164,000 pound range, is there, anybody ever see a, like a, a windmill on the road, the blade for the windmill? Well, I can tell you that when they cross over the Ohio border, they didn't put it together there. Right? So they're still on Ohio's roads and Indiana's roads. They just charge a very specific fee to get up to that weight. Right? We are grandfathered in because of, some, because of a variety of reasons, but those heaviest trucks do exist in other states as well. Okay, I saw some questions on that side. Jason will work his way around the room. Um, but did, I, I want you to know Richard and, and Leslie and Regina will get to you on that side as, as well. I'm not sure if there's a question in here or just really an observation or a comment. Sure. As a voter, I'm really concerned that you come to me to say, or what I've heard is, there is no other solution. This might not be perfect, but there's nothing else. And I, I can look around this room and say, if you leave it to us, every one of these people are going to have a different solution. Go here, go here, go here. I look at it and say, that's your job. Why isn't it done? 
when I look at your chart that said cost up, 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 I get it, costs go up. Where's the efficiency helping it go down, down, down? Is that part of this? Is, I mean, and you made a comment about, well, that only these guys read, and so you're probably right, because I didn't read anything on this, so I'm not really that familiar with it. But as just coming in and listening, it's like, this scares the heck out of me, because it, it's like, vote, raise taxes, because it's the best we got. We don't have any other answer. And not something I'm saying I'm wanting to do, but don't like the fact that I should do it because if I don't, we don't have another, we don't have plan B and we'll see what happens. Because I guarantee you something will happen. You know, uh, I, I couldn't guarantee that something will happen. And I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to legislate out of fear and I'm not trying to uh, advocate out of fear. But the, but this isn't one of those ballot proposals where, it's, you know, you could do A or B. You know, if you vote for this, it, you, you, you know, this is the winning plan or if you can vote for this and this is the winning plan. Um, this, what, what will happen is uh, more of the same until another plan is conceived. And we've seen where more of the same has gotten us. That's the chart where it's just completely dropped off. Uh, this was, you know, the, this negotiated piece between Republicans and Democrats that was intended to do uh, the, uh, the, it was intended to raise the $1.3 billion um, that we need annually. Uh, you can't cut your way to it. Uh, I would personally, me speaking as a representative and also speaking as a resident, I think you've got to get as close to a user fee as you can get. You drive on the roads, we're all contributing, I guess, to the diminishing quality of the roads if we drive on them. A user fee at the pump it probably makes the most sense. That was a plan that came out of the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, it did not pass through the House of Representatives. If I was in the House of Representatives at the time, I probably would have supported that plan. You do have this very convoluted, you know, uh, strain that goes, you know, sales tax, gas tax, whatever. It makes most sense. Let's increase revenue at the pump because that's where the users of the roads go. If that could pass in the in the Senate or the House of Representatives tomorrow, I would vote for it. But we've been through this test where last year it didn't. Um, and that's really annoying to all of us. It's annoying that the legislators last year just couldn't pass the plan. Instead, have this big, intricate, you know, proposal that does the job. My job here today was to explain a little bit about this big, intricate proposal because I don't think we're going to get back to that plan that just purely, strictly raises that at the pump uh, to pay for roads. So when 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 I say there's no plan B, I think that there are legislators up there that have no problem not finding a solution. I serve with them. Um, this is that negotiated solution between both houses, between the government, between both houses. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just quickly, you know, I sometimes give a little bit more technical perspective from the efficiency standpoint. I mean, MDOT's cut their workforce from like 3,800 employees down to 2,600. So they found efficiencies there. There are performance-based measures and outcomes within this proposal. Um, and then in addition, everybody wants to know, you know, health care costs and things like that. Nobody in the state has received a, a pension since about 97, and then they've done a cost-sharing model, usually around 80, 20 uh, for current employees. So they, they've done efficiencies to try and scale back uh, what their options are available to them to become more efficient, <coughs> and that's that's a big reason why we've had to get to, to the proposal right today. I was hoping that the efficiencies would come more in the with the technology, not certainly not necessarily well, kind of so, so from, from that standpoint to that end, uh, MDOT has consistently tried to make improvements in the way that they do things. One of the problems is I mentioned earlier, it costs money to do that, but I, I think you can take some reassurance in knowing that there is a, a part of the state called the Transportation Asset Management Council right now. And really what they do is they try and put forward the best model in which we take care of our roads. So everything from keeping a good road in good condition, taking a fair road and bringing it back to good condition, and then what we do with a road as it gets towards poor condition, and how we best spend those dollars to get the maximum amount of life. And not only are they present in this state, they, they are really the leader in the country in terms of how we manage our assets around our own network. Okay. We have, you know, about 10 minutes left. That's probably about maybe three questions more. So I know I, there are people on this side of the room, so I know we're going to move to this side of the room. If we have enough time.